Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we have the incredible Miss Chloe Masker coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast stage. This lady is absolutely phenomenal. She's a world-renowned speaker sought after for her talks on intimacy and coping and coaching and helping us, helping poor women in long-term relationships go from frustration to deep fulfillment in the connection. She's helping people all across the world find out the who's and the what's and the why's, what's going on in the relationship, how to reignite the passion in your relationship, and what's going on with our libidos. And I couldn't think of a better guest to have on Gentleman Style Podcast Show today to help us get through the fog. So without further ado, I can't help or hold this woman back any further. Help me welcome to the stage the incredible Miss Chloe Masker. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an intro. That was very special. Absolutely. It has to match the quality of the guests we're bringing on to the show. And so we do nothing less here on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. Thank you for making time for us. Thank you for being here. And thank you for giving back in this way. Because what you are doing, the work of what you're doing is significant and is absolutely necessary. And so before we dive into the I want the hard question, I want to give you that softball question. When did you know you had the gift? When did you know you had a gift in helping others figure out, women figure out what's going on in their dating life, in their sex life, and why they're losing their passion for the passion? Yeah, great question. So uh, probably going back about, well, even before that, uh, I've always had a passion for the holistic health and wellness space. And I think this is a huge, um, this is a huge component of that. And so I've always really been interested in um, people, relationships and wellness. Uh, and I think for me, when I realized that I wasn't quite clear on my passion or my purpose, I created some space in my life um, to discover that. And when I allowed some space in my life, which was about a year almost, to work out what it was that really lit me up, that's when I discovered that intimacy and relationships and sex was definitely something that I felt called to support people in in particular because we don't have a blueprint in this space. And me growing up as well, I uh, didn't have a blueprint at all. I didn't have parents who were in relationships. And so um, my mum not having another partner after my dad and my dad not having another partner after my mum became quite a unique situation where I was kind of uh, creating my own blueprint. And I realized how confusing that is, let alone people that have blueprints that maybe aren't so healthy. So I saw there was a bit of a gap there that I felt could be really valuable to start giving people tools and information that would really support them to thrive and be happy in their life, in particular in their relationships, because that's such a large component that brings us joy. And when I created the space to discover what my passion and purpose was, it was pretty evident that um, I've always leaned into a taboo conversation. I've always leaned into a conversation that most people are a little bit afraid to have. So um, when I realized that, it, there was no going back and it was pretty uncomfortable to start with. But once I leant into it, uh, I really solidified that this is a space for me. Absolutely. That's huge. What and. Speaking to the women going through that same thing where they're not seeing their passion, their parents be passionate anymore, not loving on each other as much anymore. What do you, what, what do you commonly see or what did you do? Where were you pulling your sources from? Was it, you know, movies, film, media, mm -hmm. um, Zane magazine, you know what I mean? Where, where were you get, cause you had to construct it on your own, right? The passionate intimacy Absolutely. and what's the most going on. So what kind of sources do women have to pull from in order to to fill that yeah i love that question it's interesting um let me just feel into it for a moment i for sure yeah i i feel like i'm 37 so when i was growing up uh in terms of intimacy movies was definitely something that i 
I gauged as a representation of what was normal and what wasn't. And what I've only realized in the last couple of years was I think because there was no blueprint at all, my reference point was fairy tales and happy endings and everything being perfect. And I think that was really detrimental um, to for me in relationship because I put relationships on a pedestal. And as much as it's nice to have um, movies as a reference point and the happy ending and all of that, you know, it's okay for us to allow space in relationships to not be perfect and for them to be challenging and to also provide a really confronting mirror where there's parts of us that need to be looked at and healed. And I think for me, um, my mindset was definitely based um, on movies. And now I'm really grateful that that's been able to shift. Um, but my passion and and deep love for um, what I do now, I think was an interest in people and really observing people from a young age. I grew up as an only child. And so I was around a lot of adults and I was a lot more of a listener and a, an observer than a talker. And so I, by watching people and watching interactions, and I realized I was really interested in observing people and understanding behavioral patterns and things like that. So I think it all kind of ties in nicely to, you know, no surprise that I am where I am now. Mm -hmm. But the movies, I love that you raise that because I don't think I'm alone in feeling like that's been a representation of, of you know, a blueprint for relationships and intimacy and, you know, the door swings open and they're madly kissing and there's all this hot and heavy um, visuals. Freezing. And then, yeah, and then within like two minutes, it's all over. <laughs> right, right. It's so true. It's so true. What you're speaking on is significant, even as a man, right? When you, you know, parents do their best to be discreet outside of like, you know, the occasional playful banter, the little tap on the butt, the kiss on the cheek. But that doesn't really answer the innate question, the underlying question, right? That doesn't solve the, the, the big question. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. We have to pull from our sources. And as a gentleman, right, the show is called Gentleman Style Podcast. And I have to pull from Romeo and Juliet and the knight in yes. shining armor and the prince rescuing the princess from the castle. So I'm making up my own example of what it is to be in relationships and have relations with the opposite sex. So you're so right. You're so spot on. I just wanted to hear it from the expert herself. Big round of applause for Miss Master. I wanted to continue to dive with you on the journey that what you see as an expert, as a coach to many women, what are the biggest challenges um, you have seen face and plague us as an intimate expert? What have you seen us struggle with the most um, that we're not doing well in relations? We're not doing well in the bedroom anymore. What are the big ones? Mm, great question. My The most common thing, and I think there's a few different directions from this point, but the biggest one is communication. So mm. this comes back to, again, we were not taught how to communicate with people, let alone in relationship, let alone about the more taboo topics. So what I have noticed is a lot of challenges come from lack of communication or um, Com uh, communication avoidance or something to do with a breakdown in communication or a discomfort around having conversations about you may be dissatisfaction with intimacy or low libido. And so that's always something that I focus on with clients is communication because I think no matter what the challenge or the problem is, if you can effectively communicate then even if you don't know what you like or you don't know how to reignite your libido or bring spark back to a relationship if you have a solid foundation of communication you can tackle it as a team you can work together to get through the challenge if you are both leaning into communication so i think a breakdown in communication is definitely something that 
I feel a lot of people are challenged with. And I think we're all trying to work out how to communicate in the world, let alone bringing in intimacy and sex. People are still quite uncomfortable having conversations about it and don't know how because those conversations are not, you know, you don't even see them in movies. You know, there is no communication about intimacy and sex. So where with less of a blueprint, even more so than the the visuals and how the dynamic might look, because we really don't have anyone demonstrating really healthy communication. Um, and I think that that makes sense that that's a big problem for most people. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. When you see this happening in us, when when is the right time to bring up um, low libido? When is the right time? Is it before we're intimate? When we're intimate? After we're intimate? Hey, I, hey, hold up! Before you pack up and leave, let me explain what happened. Right? When is the right time to bring up um, intim- intimacy problems and low libido and things like that? Mm, yeah, I want to. Um... I want to be clear that everyone's situation will be different, but I'm, sure. I think it's extremely important to bring it up as, as soon as possible. Um, and I mean that because you need to start inviting conversations about things straight away and be brave enough to have a really uncomfortable or clunky conversation. The more that we can do that, the more we can normalize these difficult conversations, the easier they actually are to have. And so, for example, I've I've struggled with low libido in a previous relationship, and really, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's honest. No, sorry, forgive me. Forgive me. Yeah, absolutely. That's- yeah, and I think this is why, even though it was really uncomfortable, I think this is important because going through it is really, really difficult. It's a it's an uncomfortable feeling. It's not. Um, especially when I had never experienced anything like that before. And so for me, I kind of took that on myself and I went off on my own little discovery journey. And I wanted to, I immediately thought it was something wrong with my physical body. And so for me to go on that journey alone and, you know, think something's wrong with me and not want to talk about it and having my partner bring it to my attention and then me, you know, feel the need to kind of dismiss it. I mean, that conversation could have been had right in the very beginning of this all unfolding. And even when I didn't have answers, still talking about it and saying, look, I'm noticing that, you know, I'm maybe not feeling as drawn to intimacy and um, at the moment, but let me just do some exploration. And in the interim, I don't want you to feel like I don't Uh, love you or care for you or want to connect with you. So let's find something, another way that we can do that while I'm working out what's going on, you know, with me. So that you're not dismissing your partner, that you're not dismissing their feelings and you're still validating where you're at um, without having to have an answer before you raise it with your partner, because you're a couple, you're a team. And it may be something that requires both of you to work through together. It may be, in my case, my partner was avoiding conflict and we wouldn't resolve disagreements. And I felt extremely uncomfortable and I didn't feel that there was a resolution with that. So therefore my partner played a part in that because he wasn't leaning into um, resolving disagreements. Um, So you know, it could be us as individuals that are uh, contributing to the problem by not taking care of ourselves, or it could actually be a relational dynamic that's impacting. So you've got to have the conversation really early, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. As a partner, when should my, my, my girlfriend, my wife is trying to communicate to me that there's a problem? What are some things I should be listening for that should tune me in to, oh, this is, hey, hey, get out of, get out of over here and dial it in here and listen to these things. What are some common things or phrases I might hear from my partner? Basically, it's a cry for help, right? It's a cry for, I need help. I'm working on it. I need you to listen. What are some things that partners should be kind of pervy to and aware of? Yeah, I think anything that they're raising 
around I'm not feeling myself or I'm feeling often as women uh, when we're tired or exhausted or overwhelmed and have a lot on our plate, that can very quickly switch our libido off. So if you find your partner saying things like, I'm feeling really overwhelmed, I've got a lot going on, um, I'm so tired, um, you know, anything along those lines is something that even if it hasn't impacted libido yet, there is a very good chance it could. And so having conversations and taking your partner seriously and saying, okay, they're communicating with me that there's a lot going on. Let's sit down and talk about ways that we can address this and create uh, a strategy around how we can minimize the overwhelm, minimize the stress, minimize the to-do list or approach it as a team and work through it together so that we can make sure it's not going to impact her and our relationship. Um, Because that part of us turns off very quickly when we're tired or run down. Um, And we don't want to let it get to something like burnout. And we don't want it to get to a place where it really is prevalent low libido because once it starts to dip into that area, you know, it really, there is a lot more time and patience that's required. So if you can talk early, talk early. And yeah. I actually have with me at the moment, um, I thought this would come up today. So I, me and my current partner, we moved in together at the start of the year and we um, were aware that there would be quite a lot of, you know, adjustments that could happen when you're moving in together um, around who's responsible for what, whose mm-hmm. responsibility is it to do this? What is the load that this person's carrying and what is the load that the other person's carrying? And I think we underestimate how much we're actually taking on. Um, and so this is a little card deck and this card deck essentially goes um, partners really well with a book and it's basically a card deck with all these different things that we need to do around the house, whether it be with kids or without kids, but basically it's uh, responsibilities, things that need to be done, whether it be buying Christmas presents or it be being in charge of the laundry or being in charge of the kids' lunches or cooking meals. And so each of the cards represents a role or a um, a task that needs to be done. And so when you start to really look at all the different things that are required to just operate normally on a day-to-day basis, you can start to see how much load we're actually carrying. And I'm not just speaking for women here, it's also with men. And again, you know, if we want to talk to gender roles, that also plays a part. But I'm saying to really acknowledge how much load somebody's carrying and to deal with that challenge before it becomes a problem is really important. Um, And when we start to look at how much weight we have on us, then we can start to go, okay, I could probably outsource that. Or if we're in a financial position where we can, let's maybe get somebody in to support with some cleaning or dog walking or something like that so that we don't get to a point where it's like we're, you know, all the way down the hill and there's these problems in our relationship. Get on top of it early. Start to be aware when things start to slip. Make sure that you're not allowing all this weight to push down to the point where you just don't even want to be intimate with your partner or the spark starts to dwindle. Um, So that was a kind of long-winded way, Mm -hmm. but I wanted to give context to it because I think it's important and there's ways for us to get on top of these things before they become something that is a real problem in a relationship. Absolutely. So two questions. (laughs) Two questions. Um, First, the card. So how does it work? I roll a dice and I flip a card. (laughs) And today is my day to to do the dishes. Like, can you give a 3,000 foot view of the card deck? Um, Absolutely. Okay. So um, basically you've got all these different cards. You pull out the cards that are relevant to your situation. So if you don't have kids, you obviously take out all of the, um, you take out all of the kid related cards. So once you've got all of 
the cards that relate to you. You then take extreme ownership of, let's say, there's something that you want to do. So, for example, for me, I love cooking. Still a work in progress because I do all the cooking. <laughs> progress, and, progress. Like she said, making progress. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a, a huge job to take on, but I still take it on because I'm like, I like to be in control of the food. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so... <laughs> You take out you take out the cards that that you're like I would love to take on that responsibility, and then with what's left, you then uh, you can kind of divvy them up and work through it card by card, and then ideally you would want to end up and it doesn't always happen with a relatively not in the amount of cards because some of the cards will only require like five minutes once a week or an hour once a year. You, you kind of want to work out how long these particular tasks are going to take. So, for example, this one here is estate planning and life insurance. So that type of card would literally take up probably once every six months, maybe an hour or even half an hour just to go through and check if it's relevant or maybe every three months. So that's not really a lot of time taken. And so once you work out, you know, a fair load, you can then also look at things that you can outsource, which I mentioned briefly before. So yeah, these cards, you use what, um, you use what is relevant to you. Um, and then what isn't, then it's all good. What me and my partner did though, is we wanted to start with only a few because we didn't want to get too overwhelmed with all of the different things we have to do. So we pulled like the 10 most relevant cards and those 10 cards we then divvy it up and then you reevaluate maybe um, a month or two later and see, is this working for us? Is it working? Is this something that we need to adjust? Because the last thing you want is resentment. So if you feel like you're carrying more of a load than your partner, then you need to speak up and say, hey, I really want to reevaluate our cards. Let's let's actually look at what we've got here and let's maybe change this. This is a physical card system, y'all. This is not just like... Hey, I want to work on this. It's a real life physical card. Yeah. I, see, I already see my partner cheating and taking out like, <laughs> like everything. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, well, I don't know how that got in there, honey. <laughs> yeah. It like it's your, it's your card. Oh my yeah. gosh. My second it's question. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say look, I know we're not talking directly to intimacy right now, but I, I do really want to touch on the fact that it all ties in with each other. And this is honestly, this little foundational thing here and whether or not you use the cards or not, this is about creating, um, is about listening to each other, listening to each other's needs, desires, wants, whatever it is, and creating a foundation of open communication. And the impact that that has in your intimate life is much more than you realize so it's a lot harder to communicate about intimacy than it is to a, about things like chores and things to do. So if you can nail your communication in this space, then you've got a much better chance of talking about the other stuff. Absolutely. I, and that leads into my question. That absolutely makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I hear the term, what came to mind when you initially brought up the cards is I hear women say, I'm op I'm operating outside of my femininity because I'm doing all these overwhelming tasks. And so how true or untrue is is that that femininity masculinity dynamic because it comes up all the time especially when we're talking relationships like oh I'm not um I don't want to be intimate because I'm doing all of these masculine things or I'm operating outside of my femininity so I don't feel cute, I don't feel sexy. I don't feel, mm -hmm. you know, attractive today. What can you speak to the dynamic and how big that role plays? I hear it all the time. Yeah, I, I think the best relationships today are built on fluidity and flexibility. And I think what is feminine or masculine for someone is different to somebody else. And what works for someone might not work for somebody else. You know, for me personally, even though somebody else might find cooking quite a, you know, a masculine um, task, not necessarily in a gender role, but more, you know, I'm going to follow a recipe and I'm going to execute uh, a meal 
Whereas for me, I actually feel it's a very a feminine um, thing that I'm doing. So I think it really is unique to the individual. Um, and also, you know, for example, as a woman, you might actually really enjoy managing finances and that's okay as well. Um, you might be in a really masculine uh, role at work as a woman and you may want to do more feminine roles at home, but it really just depends on well, it's about uncovering who you are and what you want more of and then being able to communicate that back with your partner and find somewhere that you can you know, make your intimacy thrive so that both of you can feel really empowered to be who you are and not follow uh, what you know, society or somebody else deems is um, the right way for you. Absolutely. I'm going to play a quick game with you, doctor. Cool. Doctor, my, my ask card. Um, it, it, what can you share... <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you this. Okay. Um, a man paying all the bills, masculine or feminine? Uh to you, it, to you. To okay, to me, man paying all the bills. You know it's so funny you say that because I have been in a quite a financially controlling situation before, so I get immediately triggered when you really? say that. Yeah. So when you say a man paying all the bills, that's interesting. Um, that's hard for me to answer. Uh, okay. but yeah, it's, I feel, I find that quite, uh, quite an outdated, you know, it is, it is a masculine thing. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. What about doing laundry, masculine or feminine? Who does the laundry? <laughs> um, I like doing the laundry. I don't, Ooh. I yeah, I love doing the laundry. I love it because I feel accomplished when each cycle goes through the washing machine. <laughs> the, the hanging of the laundry is where I'm like, oh, that's annoying. But yeah, it's it could be either. I feel like anything could be either. It's really open to an interpretation of how you view the task. Sure. And you could look at it through a masculine lens or a feminine lens. You know, it's a very, you know, put the machine on. It's a very you know, systematic uh, process. But for me, it's, I, I look at it more as like, okay, well, you know, I'm, it's therapeutic. I, I'm in kind of like a bit of a flow state when I'm doing laundry. Absolutely. I love that you said it earlier on. It's kind of a fluid thing, right? So yeah. like if you started laundry and then you got mm -hmm. tied up in other things, you were on this podcast. And so you didn't have time to move it to the next load or the next cycle. And then your man comes home, your partner comes home and he walks right by it and it needs to go to the other cycle. And he doesn't do it. I could easily see someone being frustrated with that. Right. You might be frustrated with me because it's like, honey, sweetie pie, my dear, why didn't you just move the laundry along instead of, oh, well, that was because that's a feminine thing. I, I, I didn't touch the line. I think you'd be really upset. Yeah, <laughs> I so, okay, so I'm coming back to the cards. And the reason I'm doing this is because laundry, I've taken extreme ownership of. That's my role. I can't get pissed off with him because that's my role. So this is why the cards are so valuable is because there's no gray area. There's no assumptions. There's no expectations that he's going to do anything. So it actually reduces the potential of conflict about little things like the laundry and creates this space for communication about things that are way more important. So, for example, laundry, he might come and say to me, hey, and he does this, he's great. He'll come and say, um, oh, I've noticed the, the laundry's finished and I'm cooking, so I'm doing another role and he's done what he needs to do. But he's like, okay, well, I could probably, even though it's her role or her job that she's taken extreme ownership of, I can still help. But my expectation isn't that he helps. He can still offer, right. but but it's not. There's none of this like guessing game. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. That was that was well well said. That was really good. Really good. <laughs> This is impactful, y'all. This is the in. This is why she is sought after, and she's humbly gracing the gentleman style podcast show today <laughs> with her big brain. One more round of applause for Miss Master. Oh my gosh, huge, huge. We have 
to go. We have to pay some bills before our sponsors get mad at us. We will be right, right back. Don't go anyway. Stay tuned. Baby Gear Services DMV specializes in high quality baby gear rentals in the Maryland and DC metro area. We have a wide range of baby gear items for rent, including wooden cribs, car seats, high chairs, and more. We also offer seasonal specials and free delivery. Our prices are very versatile to cover every budget. Wooden cribs start at $17 a day, high chairs, and even car seats start at $5 a day. Check out our website www.bgsdmv.com Support for Gentleman Style Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers you precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right. The 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code GENSTYLE at manscaped.com. the gentleman style podcast show we have the incredible miss chloe maskard on the show today spilling the tea on <laughs> intimacy relationships libido we're covering some really profound things we even touched on men, men uh, feminine and masculine energy very very powerful topic she has a whole car game built around to alleviate a lot of the some of the problems a lot of the problems that we're experiencing today in relationships if you missed that scroll back check her out she's absolutely phenomenal Miss Masker, I wanted to go. I wanted to stay right here because this is good. I got you in the zone. And I'm really wondering why. Because we were talking about relationships to things that would alleviate each other's load, alleviate her load so she can get back operating in her femininity. Why do women fake orgasms? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a curveball there. That was a why are we faking yes. orgasms in the bedroom? Yes. Great question. You know what? I'm recording a podcast with somebody this afternoon um, specifically about this topic. So thank you for bringing it up and bringing it to my attention. You know, it's really interesting. There are so many different reasons why women will fake orgasms. And so it is often a combination of a few reasons. It's not normally one reason that people do. Um, and I've tested this out with some clients and with some friends. I put down all the reasons that I've collated and come across in my time working as an intimacy um, expert. And I wrote them all on all these post-it notes and I get people to pull the post-it notes that resonate with them as a reason why they might fake an orgasm. And it is never the case that they will just pick one. It is often a decent stack of a few different reasons as to why people will fake it. Um, it. There are so many different reasons, but a lot of the time, you know, the top three reasons are normally around um, pleasing their partner. For women, pleasing their partner. Um, it might also be wanting to end the experience quickly. And that might be due to them not enjoying it or not being able to get out of their head and into their body um, and not feeling comfortable to speak up about, oh, I would rather try this or I want to try this or not even knowing what they want to do, but knowing that that particular experience isn't maybe feeling great for them. Uh, and then, you know, there's other reasons, you know, we've seen this expectation that there's only one way to experience orgasm, which is through uh, penetration. And the truth is only 20%, 15 to 20% of women can experience um, orgasm from that alone. And so there's this mismatch between, you know, men and women and how they can experience orgasm. So, and we as women don't know that stat. M most of us don't know that stat. So, it's important to really understand and and 
communicate around what is normal or common um, so that we're not putting this additional pressure on ourselves to show up and perform and, you know, present that we're experiencing enjoyment and pleasure when really we might not be. Um, but there's truckload of different reasons why that might happen. And that's true. It's not no, it's not a cookie cutter answer. There's a st- like you said, your, your clients, uh, will sometimes grab several, not just yeah. one, like this is the sole reason why. And if we can just solve this one reason, right. I think all of us would have mm. the golden ticket there, but it's, it's, it's multiple things. It's, and that's why communication, that's why you stress it. That's why you teach to it. And that's why you coach to it. So thank you for breaking that down so delicately and so, so calmly, right? Because it's not an easy topic. And so that, that is huge. Um, Do you ever encourage on top of communication, on top of the cards, do you ever encourage um, sex toys and, and, and toys to help get her back in the mood or get things going again or to initiate sex? Absolutely. So a lot of the time when I work with a client, I'll work with a client around their own self-exploration first because what will happen is I think we've never really often we've not really given ourselves the space to learn what brings us pleasure and Mm. I think it's so important for it to start with us it has to start with okay I need to learn who I am. I need to know who I am. I need to know what brings me joy and pleasure. And I need to experiment with myself and give, start to allow my body to experience different types of pleasure and identify what I like and what I don't like. And I think by doing that exploration solo is great because we are not worrying about the other person being there. And it's removed that default for a lot of us to, um, you know, prioritize our partner's pleasure first. Uh, So it creates a space for us to be more curious and to drop into our body and go, okay, this is my space and my time to see what I like and what feels good for me. And once we discover what those things are, and that could be incorporating toys and things like that, we build confidence to experience pleasure. We build confidence to try new things because we're not worried about the other person's opinions. And once we build that confidence within ourselves, then we return, you know, bring these new things that we've discovered back to the relationship, um, which is a beautiful way for you to connect with your partner. But if you're not connected to yourself and you're in pleasure first, it's really difficult to just go straight to, go straight to the, uh, relationship and the intimacy and the sex because we've missed the part of self first. Absolutely. Absolutely. Should there be an opportunity when, when I'm in a relationship, should self pleasure stop? Mm. Should I continue to use sex toys? Should sex toys, because now I have a partner, I shouldn't need to introduce you know, all these different t- dildos everywhere in the, the top drawer. We all know what's in the top drawer, right? Um, <laughs> should it stop or should it continue? Oh, you, I feel like you know the answer to this, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take it anyway. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. I, you know, I think we, again, I, I, I remember hearing this from somewhere and I'm not sure where. I, I believed that once you're in a relationship, the self-pleasure stops. And if you are self-pleasuring, that for some reason I believe that meant that the sex isn't good enough or that there's not enough of it or that it was some reflection on the relationship being wrong or flawed or not enough in some way. But as I've gone through my work, that is not the case at all. In fact, it's in particular for people with low libido, they'll come to me and they'll often say, well, I only have a little bit of desire for intimacy. So why would I waste that little bit of desire that I've got on self-pleasuring? And I'm like, okay, interesting, because that's something that's come up a lot. So then I say, all right, just let's take, you know, that thought process and that belief away for a minute. And let's just explore with yourself anyway and self-pleasure and and see how you feel. And what always happens is that by self-pleasuring, you actually 
start to desire intimacy and sex and it creates more of a spark um and it brings back your libido just by self-pleasure uh and that's something that a lot of people don't expect um that they have this sort of quota and that they feel guilty for do doing the solo exploration when really they should be using that quota for their partner so that's interesting it is interesting because we think it i, I have a, a finite i've lost my desire so when i do i don't want to lose it for them and waste uh you know my mario token on you know i only got so many golden tickets right yeah. and so i only got so many in the chamber so they don't want to waste it so i do see that mm -hmm. and that's why i had to ask you i told you i've been i've been watching you man <laughs> well i've been listening <laughs> i'm like oh this is good this is the right person yeah. to ask i got it right here at the right time this is huge y'all mm -hmm. i wanted to ask this question how do you help or do you at all work with clients who have experienced trauma related mm -hmm. to intimacy yeah and how do you address that because there's there's something made there's a huge blocker and your client may already be aware like i know why i don't have this desire right now mm -hmm. and and this is it and so how do you coach people through that or couples through that or women through that so when it comes to the space of trauma, I'm very conservative when it comes to my scope of practice. Now, I, you know, I've had so many different conversations and worked with so many different professionals um, over the years. So I feel like I have a really good baseline of understanding trauma. However, as a coach, I will, if there is a client that I don't feel has fully healed from that trauma it's not a good idea for us to start working together if they have addressed that space and it is something that um isn't having a deep impact on them at that point in time then we can definitely do things but it's good to know that information and know where they're at in that journey so that we know how to still help them in their intimacy and pleasure and relationships without reactivating these wounds. And I think where I come in is I can definitely support in ways to communicate with their partner about these types of things and how to also build a really beautiful relationship with themselves and also their connection with their own pleasure and what sex and pleasure now means to them. So the stories that we've associated with sex might be very different because of what we've experienced. So as a coach, I'm cautious, but there's definitely benefit working with somebody like me if you have moved through and away from the really deep and and um, confronting trauma that can happen in particular if we're talking about sexual assault or things like that. And I think it's a beautiful opportunity to work with a coach to reestablish new stories around sex and to find positive ways of leaning into intimacy and re, um, rewiring and reestablishing uh, your feelings and um, desires when it comes to sex and intimacy. I love that. I love that. I love that. Most coaches that you you talk to, they don't do that, right? When they 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 pose themselves as an all around expert, and they don't humble themselves enough to say, "Listen, this is this is where I have to, you know, this is where my expertise is." Yeah. And you and most people wouldn't do that. Most coaches wouldn't do that. They would they would try and take you on anyway, and not realize that I may not have the space for this to help you with this. Um. So I recommend you go to an actual therapist who's yeah. actually trained with the tools to help you. And then we can come back, right? That's yeah. really, really big and really, really powerful for you to acknowledge that and have that real heart to heart because everybody's like, let me just take their money. I'm going to just take their money and we'll <laughs> figure it out along the way. And you're mm. not, you're saying, I'm not going to do that to you. No, I, I this is the thing. When I first started in this space, I had the choice. I could have gone down the, psychology route. I could have gone down and been a sexologist. I could have done 
all of that. But what the reason I chose to be a coach is because I didn't want people coming to me problem solution. That I didn't want that. I, I don't want to be the person that people come to when they're like in the depths of it and they're like, I just want to fix. I wanted to help people who want to up level their life, who want to have deeper intimacy, deeper connection, a more fulfilling relationship with sex and feeling confident within themselves. So they're very different things. And, you know, that's what I do is I help people um, create more positive experiences that surround it as opposed to fixing a problem that they might have. And that's, that's not what a coach does. They might come with like a belief or like a challenge, but a, a really prevalent challenge around trauma, like that's a different space. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely profound. What are your thoughts on the impact of pornography uh, mm -hmm. on intimate relationships? <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I dig. Uh, I dig. I dig a little. I dig a little. Well, because this this helps, right? These are real life things that we're dealing with on a day to day basis. And so I, I've I've known men to be guilt tripped by this, right? You're watching porn and I'm not home. I'm off to work or I'm at the grocery store. I'm at the market and you're watching pornography. But is that what is that a bad thing? Just like we earlier discussed, if you guys missed that, go back, scroll back and check her out. But it, just like the introduction of, of toys, right, there should be some expiration. And I feel like if we stare on that heartbeat, is it still expiration if I'm watching pornography without you? Yeah, it's. It's a big topic, but I want to just highlight a couple of things. Um, sure. There are, funnily enough, there are positive things that can come from it. Exploration, experimentation, if two partners in a relationship find it a turn on or want to, you know, watch together and that brings them pleasure, then of course. Um, my preference is going down the route of more ethical choices in the types of content that you consume because I know that there's... Um, a lot of access to pornography out there where the people who are in the um, in it are not being financially compensated and there is, you know, some other things that might be going on. But what I will say around the negative impacts is the big one that I've noticed is unrealistic expectations. And this is something that I'm always working with people on is that's their reference point. You know, we said movies. But porn is like way more prevalent when it comes to the beliefs and thoughts that we have and using that as a yardstick to measure out what's normal and what's not. And for example, when you watch porn, you'll notice that often um, women will either orgasm in the same amount of time as men or you know, ballpark, that will be the case. And that doesn't often happen from foreplay. It will often happen from penetration. I mentioned 15% of women uh, orgasm from penetration. That's not, you know, that's not what's being um, depicted in porn. And also um, how long it takes women to orgasm is um, around 20 minutes. And for men, it's like five to seven minutes on average. So there's a mismatch. Yes. And when we look at porn, that's not like we're not seeing that. We're not seeing the the actual stats um, being reflected. Uh, I think as well that kind of ties into this pressure to perform. You know that we're we're putting on this performance and we're you know replicating behaviors and noises and sounds that we're watching, and we're not actually tapping into our body and you know trusting our instincts and kind of expressing ourselves from a place of genuine pleasure we're just you know copy paste the noises and um ways in which people are having sex and so i think that can be really detrimental Absolutely. i also think yeah the um erosion of emotional connection is a big one as well um we're, we're so focused on the physical satisfaction that it actually you know, can limit our deeper emotional connection What, where that true intimacy is required. Um, and so the focus is always on the physical and not on the deep emotional 
an intimate connection that is a huge part of of sex um so yeah that i mean that's i've noticed that a lot and um it can come up a lot in relationships where it's just treated as physical and we're missing and this is why i refer to myself as an intimacy coach instead of a sex coach because intimacy is is the the bind that connects sex relationships you know all the physical and um the love and everything all together it's more than just the act there's so much more depth and we need the emotional connection too in order to have a really healthy relationship absolutely intimacy to me is the the hand holding the kissing the touches throughout the day the the affirmations right your partner affirming you and 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 making you strong and boosting that confidence um it's the it's the work that is not a one and done because sex is one and done, but intimacy is a prolonged um, exposure. It's it's consistent, yeah. like a it's little drips, it's little drips consistently. That's the thing. It's consistent. Mm -hmm. That's what comes to mind for me when I think yeah. about the two. So very powerful, doctor. Very powerful. Uh, this is incredible insight. I, it was shocking to me, and and you're right. Um, pornography the shows a falsehood, right? You're thinking, okay, I gotta make this last two hours, and so you know you're drinking all the juice and all the vitamin water. And you're taking your your supplements, and you're like, all right, I'm ready to bang it out. And it's this <laughs> Olympic triathlon, and that's not, <laughs> it's not the case. It's not true. And so yeah. you're right; it does present a, a false narrative for us when we watch it, and it's like, okay, let me go in and do this. And now she's scared to death because when did he learn that? How did what? We've never done this. Yeah. It, it causes a mismatch all around, not just in, in timing, but falsehood. Yeah. I really want to talk to, I know that we've spoken about women, but this is another thing I'm really passionate about is I'm, we as women, um, we do struggle to get into our body and out of our head, but men struggle with this a lot too. And what you're speaking to right now is extremely important to highlight is if as men, we definitely feel, you know, as men, they feel the need to perform and show up as this stud that can last, you know, the hours. And when you're in that headspace, you're not in your body. You're showing up to intimacy and, and you're showing up to sex in your head, trying to execute a performance and you're not even enjoying the experience. You are physically because your body and your anatomy is enjoying it. But if you're you're rocking up to an encounter with somebody like your partner with in your head thinking I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to, you know, I can't, I can't um come too quickly, you know, I've got to last. And then if I if I do, then I have to back it up. You know, as a woman, she can really tell when you're not in your body. Mm. And 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 so we all essentially want to be able to drop into our body and relax and be able to just go feel all the feelings and feel all of the pleasure that comes from just the actual act because that the being naked with your partner and feeling that connection is more than just the physical act but if you're in your head and you're you can't be in your body and be feeling that enjoyment and that um, uh, that bonding hormones that come from this experience when we're just so put ourselves under so much pressure. Absolutely. So I wish I had a bomb, like a mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> mic drop moment. That is so, <laughs> so good. Miss Maskert, I wanted to ask, uh, this is my last question for you. I wanted to ask about um, working with the LGBTQ, have you? Do you work with them at all? How do you approach intimacy in issues in the LGBTQ community? Um, are there differences, or if at all, if any, or are they experiencing the same problems? Yeah, interesting. You raise that. Um, I haven't had the privilege of working with anyone in that space, and I would definitely consider it. Actually, no, I, I have. I actually have. And you know what? I treated that exactly the same as any other relationship. Um, and 
it didn't, it actually didn't even cross my mind that I had because I didn't look at the dynamic as being any different because fundamentally every relationship is different. And, you know, we've spoken about the masculine feminine energies. Absolutely. It's the same. And, just, and gen, gender roles as well, like it's all pretty fluid now. So I would absolutely be open to that. I think if you, again, this comes back to my scope of practice and me being aware of this, like I did my training with an amazing group of people and those, that group of people, um, we have people in that space that have also got the same certification as me that specialize with certain, you know, members of the community. If I feel that it would be more beneficial for me to um, offer a, a suggestion to work with somebody else because it's out of my scope, by all means, that, that whatever serves the client best. Um, in my experience, I was able to serve this client um, very well with um, the information and the knowledge that I had. Uh, and most of the time you can. But um, if it came to that, there's absolutely people out there that can support specifically if there's um, things that maybe don't uh, represent a heterosexual relationship. Absolutely. This is epic, epic, epic conversation. Ms. Maskard, you are absolutely phenomenal. You're my hero. You have become <laughs> my hero. And this is absolutely necessary. These are the types of conversations we need to be having. I want to say thank you for sharing these great insights. Uh, if you had one more nugget, you've shared so many nuggets this episode on how to handle relationships, what to do with a load libido, how to handle these things. If you have one more nugget in the hat and there's that young girl out in the audience who is scared to death on what she should do, whether she should book a, a consultation with you, whether she should reach out, mm -hmm. should she reach out? Is it safe to reach out? What would you say to that young girl right now watching this um, who's scared to death on what she should do? Mm, absolutely. I think it's a beautiful space to just find um, a conversation about intimacy and sex that isn't as welcomed as what we would like. So if I can hold space for somebody to share some challenges or concerns that they might have, um, it is so healing just to have a space where you can talk about things that you feel shame or discomfort around. And I think there's value in that. And I think it can be very healing um, and cre can create a beautiful connection to yourself and also with others as well. So I would suggest it would be a great idea to reach out and have a chat and see if you feel comfortable. Absolutely. How can we connect with you? How can we find you? The train has left the station, but it's not too late to hop on board. How can we connect and find you? Absolutely. So I'm on Instagram, the honey ed official. I also have a podcast, which is called honey dash ed and it's called intimacy made easy. And so you can catch me there or my website, honey dash ed.com. Love it. Love it. Phenomenal. Well, sports friends, we are out of time. <laughs> we have to let this incredible speaker go. She has many more relationships and couples to save and help and families to, to get back on track. So we got to let her go. But thank you all. Thank you, Miss Chloe Masker. I want to say to this to you publicly, don't ever quit. We need what you're doing. Thank oh, you for what you're thank doing. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning into the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I hope this message has been helpful, impactful, and I hope it takes you, your relationship, to the next level. Because that's the goal. That's the goal. Like we end every show. Take care of your friends. Take care of your family. And always, always, take care of business. This is Marcus, <laughs> your favorite gentleman. And the superlistic Axbrialidocious Chloe Mascard of Honey.ed signing off. Love you guys. Bye.